If we don't win an Emmy Award, my hair will. <laughs> And hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Mondays in Midtown. I'm Mark Zinn. We had a few snow days last week, which preempted, of course, this broadcast on your local closed circuit television station. Um, it also caused a lot of headaches for tra uh, travelers throughout the region, especially toward the north and the west of St. Louis, but it was fun to have a snow day. Take a look at this awesome snow day segment. St. Louis dodged the winter storm bullet last week, but with snow, sleet, and ice on the radar, Many schools were called off Tuesday and Wednesday, including SLU, which closed its campus from Monday afternoon through Thursday morning. SLU hasn't been closed for that long since the great blizzard of 1982, and we all know what happened there. Nearly 24 inches of snow fell, but this was different. There was, of course, ice, sleet, and snow, But then you add winds of nearly 40 miles per hour, and you have two slew snow days, and some happy slew students rejoicing. The storm didn't deliver. I guess it missed us, and a lot of places did get a lot of snow, but we didn't really get anything. But at least the anticipation got us two snow days, which was nice. So I can't complain about that, but um, yeah, the snow apocalypse was, was pretty weak, in my opinion. Um, I liked it because we had two days off, obviously, but... I'm used to because I'm from Chicago. We actually had a, lot, had a lot worse, so it's not really a big deal to me, I guess. Uh, there was a lot of snow. I, I've never seen that snow much, much snow in my life, and all the news was telling me it was going to be terrible. I bought like four gallons of water and non-perishable food items. I was prepared for the worst, and it was super icy. I slipped a couple times. And the Even though it wasn't the worst storm on the books, St. Louis roads were at times difficult to use. You look at some of the streets like Grand. Yeah, it has a little snow on it, but it's still pretty clear. Cars can pass, you know, move at a slow speed. But then look at streets like Olive. Completely covered with snow. That covers the whole street all the way down. Why is that? Well, Mark, City Streets Director Todd Walterman says some secondary roads don't see treatment because the city prioritizes its routes. So roads like Grand and Lindell see much more attention compared to streets like Olive and Spring. Unless you had car troubles like our good friend Little Debbie, St. Louis residents managed the storm. But when doing so, they bundled up. Okay, and joining us now back here on the window, outside of the window on SLU rather, is Chief Meteorologist here at SLU 22 and Chief Meteorologist of the Storm Alert Weather Team, David Keller. Hello, David. Hey, Mark. How are you doing? Doing well. Everyone wants to know what happened with that storm. It was supposed to be a snow eclipse. We were supposed to get all this snow, uh, but I hear the sleet had something to do with that. Yeah, we had a little bit of warm air come in, in the uh, middle layer of the atmosphere, and that caused the snow that was falling to melt down into those little ice pellets that we saw called sleet, and that really cut into our snowfall totals. If that hadn't happened, we could have seen that 8 to maybe 12 inches of snow here on campus, but uh, unfortunately, we saw that, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, we saw that sleet and therefore only two inches accumulation here on campus. And, and with that sleet, I mean, it wasn't expected to be sleeting for that, that long period of time. I mean, I, yeah, I woke up on, I guess it was Wednesday morning, and, you know, they were like, oh, it's going to be turning over slow any, or snow any, any moment now, and it didn't. Yeah, we, we really expected the, the sleet to change over to snow very quickly. Unfortunately, the storm was a little bit stronger than we thought it would be, and therefore it went just a little bit further, further north, and that sleet snow line shifted to the north of St. Louis, and therefore we saw sleet the entire day rather than snow. It was still a messy situation, though. It definitely was. The roads were very slick with all that sleet accumulation, and that's why we didn't have school for two days. Interesting, interesting. Well, you know, everyone did some fun things on snow days. Snow day, I'm sure you did. He did, trust me. I also had fun. I went out to report in the snow, I guess it was Tuesday evening, and the, uh, as, we, as they say in the business, the camera got turned on me. Take a look. 
So, Colin, you know, we had two days off of school. What did you do with your uh, snow days? Well, I read a lot, Mark. Um, obviously did all my homework for uh, Wednesday because I didn't know if we had a snow day, so I wanted to be uh, sure I... You hedged your bets. I, uh, yeah, I hedged your bets. I did the opposite of hedge. I let my hedges grow. It's not a bad from the meat. I just want to say I'm Mike Zinn right now, though. I'm Mike. No relation to Mark Zinn. None. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, how did you do on the snow day? It was pretty good. Made some Scott French toast. Grandma. Made French toast. Oh, no. France is probably seeing similar conditions right now. You know oh, so. They usually do. They're Northern, hem Northern Hemisphere. Sure. So, Mark, what did you do on your snow day? Well, I played a lot of Halo. Uh, nice. Uh, and I, uh, I uh, Mark, tell us what you're uh, wearing right now. I am wearing a uh, a now illegal. Oh, that no, It was once produced. In okay, let's get the inside. Uh, it's illegal somewhere in Norway. Why? Norway. It was left it's at my apartment. High, high, sta high standard of living in Norway. They very warm. Very warm. Why, why is it illegal now? Well, bear forest. <laughs> it says bear forest on the back. Yeah, you don't Do you want to know that. Yeah. <laughs> so this is too much for TV. Don't want to get into the law aspect. You know, some of our viewers are ignorant. I haven't scored, uh, you know, a garment law. I specialize in garment law. We're not gonna edit this. I don't think we're gonna edit this. We don't have to edit. Right now, it's, it's you know, there's really heavy winds. And last sleep. So, so Mark, when did you steal in Indiana Jones' hat? I took Indiana Jones' hat about uh, 13 months ago. Uh, and it's uh, doing well. That's right. Well, I bet. Because you know, I try to be. I make all all the necessary uh, necessary attempts to become hip with society. So, Mark, yeah. say you're at shopping today. Maybe you. Uh, I'm Albert. Mark, that one. Total value. Uh, I know. Uh, third one. Ah, uh, yeah. Third person. <laughs> uh, if you drop your hat before the sliding doors, and uh, you happen to walk through the sliding doors and then you realize you drop your hat, do you, would you reach into the sliding doors and grab your hat at just the last minute? You lose your hat at I didn't him. hear a word you said. <laughs> I heard shop and save. I lost to a shop and save and I love the voiceover the overhead beat. Oh, I've never seen a shop and save. I would have never been there tonight. And that's all I got. You don't know, so be careful out there. You know, ice and snow, take it slow. But Take it slow. Take it slow. A lot of fun stuff on snow days. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining us now is the Associate Sports Editor of the University News, Derek Dinner. Derek, good to see you. Nice to see you, too. Uh, we have some uh, breaking news that came out just a little bit ago about the men's soccer team. Yeah, uh, Coach Mike McGinty signed his first class to slew. Uh, there's four kids, one of them to transfer, Cal McKee from, St uh, from Santa Clara University. He went to uh, high school here in St. Louis, so he's still kind of... Where did he go to high school? He went to Chaminade which is out in the county, uh, Jesuit prep school. It's not Jesuit, it's horrible school. Okay, I'm sorry, it's not Jesuit prep. It is a prep school, though. Uh, and what I like about this class, he's got some kids from uh, Dallas, Jesuit, and from, uh, is it Mesquite? I think yeah. Mesquite down in uh, Texas. You're really seeing how McGinty's tapping into that Jesuit prep soccer, something that the last coach didn't do so well. McGinty can see that talent and bring it out. 
Do you think it'll be a good? Uh, we'll have a good team next year, then. Yeah, yeah. Everything that I've seen about this soccer team looks like they are shaping up to be. I will. I don't want to say national contender just yet, but I would definitely think that they're going to be ranked. They weren't last year. They're probably going to c compete for the Atlanta title. And how's the basketball team look? <laughs> well, the basketball team looks like we expected them to look after they lost Carmen and Willie. It's it's rough. They lose games they shouldn't. They win games they shouldn't. They're in games. It's a roller coaster. We really don't know who's going to show up each night. Some guys are having good nights, other guys are not. Do we know when uh, Mitchell or Reed will return? Yeah, Mitchell will be, well, Mitchell's with the team now. Uh, he said he won't play this year for us, of course. Willie, we don't have a timetable for that. I would say Mitchell will be back on court next year. Not that that helps us for the rest of sure. February and March. And really quickly, uh, it's hard to note, we had the Super Bowl yesterday. Yes, we did. Uh, fun, a fun game all the way around. Pretty good game, too, but the Green Bay Packers came out on top, huh? Yeah, I was. I, I thought Green Bay was going to win the game, to be honest. I'm going to pat myself on the back for that one. Um, Green Bay got out early. They got out big early. Uh, they, you know, they didn't have to rely on their defense to stop Ben Roethlisberger, and Roethlisberger didn't have really anything to be stopped. So, great job by Aaron Rodgers. He deserved to finally have his own title, step out of Brett Favre's shadow, and uh, congratulations to all the Green Bay fans. Well, Derek, I appreciate you joining us. And speaking of the Super Bowl, our own Taylor McDonald went out on the streets to gauge some student reactions to last night's big game. Take a look. Did you watch the Super Bowl? Yes, I did. Which team did you want to win? The Packers. I wanted the Bears to win. They got pretty far from Chicago, but past that, I didn't care. Um, I'm not really a big sports fan, but I did watch the game, and after the Packers went up 14 to zip, I decided to side with the Steelers. And I mean, it ended up being, I guess, a pretty good game. They had a pretty good comeback, but, you know, didn't pull it out. Uh, did you watch the Super Bowl? Good. Yes. Uh, which team did you want to win? Green Bay. So you did want them to win. How'd you feel when they won that? I was happy. I won five bucks, so it was, made me even happier. Uh, did you watch the Super Bowl the other I night? I did watch the Super Bowl. Which team did you want to win? Uh, my team was not in the Super Bowl. It was actually the Houston Texans. We always we always go five and zero, but we always manage to go like five and like thirteen at the end of the season. So hopefully next season we can recuperate and stuff like that. But uh, I wanted the Steelers to win, but that didn't happen. So sorry, Big Ben. Go Packers. Yeah, I guess. Uh, did you watch the Super Bowl? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, did the team you want, did the Packers win it? Did you want them to win? or? Not at all. Okay, so my mom was born in Chicago. I lived in Chicago for like a year, you know? And then I come here, and then there's all these Chicago ones everywhere. And I get my Chicago roots back and my pride, and I, I establish my, my uh, nice little uh, love for the Chicago Bears. And then... What happens, they lose their rival, the Packers, which went off the Super Bowl, and so I decided to go for any team against the Packers, which ended up being the Steelers, and if they didn't win, I'm pissed. Did you watch the Super Bowl? Uh, a little bit. Did you want the Packers to win, or? Uh, no, I did not want the Packers to win. And again, that was Taylor McDonald on the streets, gauging the students, as always, with that Super Bowl topic. Joining us now is Luke Gatta. He is the co-chair of the Great Issues Committee to talk about uh, the upcoming speaker. We have a speaker on Wednesday. Who is it? We do. Professor Michael Cox is flying in from London to speak to us. So we're pretty honored to have him here today, um, or tomorrow, sorry, or Wednesday. Um, he's coming to talk about the speech topic is President Obama and the end of the American Empire. Very controversial topic. I'm sure people will be out there talking about this one. Um, his name, you might not have heard of him, but in the intellectual world, people have heard of this guy. He, his fingers on the pulse of what's going on in America today. So, What time does the event start? It's at 8 p.m. in the BSC bar, the first one. So it's going to be a very intimate event. Only 400 people allowed. Cool, wow. And you'll have to look forward to our uh, exclusive sit-down with Michael Cox on next Monday's uh, in Midtown. We might even have a little cash cab uh, segment. Not sure. But uh, either way, it's time for Lyle's Corner. Lyle's Corner. Whoa, it's Lyle's Corner, boys and girls. Come on down. You'll learn about cool things around the town. It's Lyle's Corner! That's the Lyle's Corner iPhone app, actually, that just came out recently. Um, it's been in development for a couple of months now, and we finally have it on the market. So uh, it's a free application if you have an iPhone. Uh, just go ahead and snag it. This is where the magic happens, guys. This is where um, all my biddies come around and edit together my footage and Mark's footage and uh, this is where Mondays in Midtown happens. I'm surprised Mark hasn't given you a you know a little 
little little background to this yet. This is the dream team. Come out here. There's David sitting at the desk, being busy. There's a green screen. This is often where I go swimming with fish and whales. You can't see it right now, but I'm a mermaid. Um, these are cameras. And uh, that's it. And again, the views expressed on Lyle's Corner don't necessarily reflect those of Mondays in Midtown, the University, or Father Biondi. It's also time for our newest commentary segment, Communicating with Dr. Z. Schaefer. Uh, lately in my two classes, which are Human Communication and Culture, which is a foundational level course mainly uh, aimed towards freshmen and sophomores, and then my Leadership and Teams course, which is geared for upperclassmen, we're talking about issues of leadership and effective communication in the media. And two prominent examples come to mind. Uh, last night we had our State of the Union address given by President Obama. And then also, and more interestingly probably, is the controversy surrounding Amy Chua, the battle hymn of the Tiger Mother. Uh, Amy Chua is a law professor at Yale and she wrote a book basically dialoguing and diatribing about her events as a mother because she's raising her, her two children according to traditional Chinese values. And there's some pretty controversial things in her book. Uh, for instance, growing up, she wouldn't allow them to have sleepovers, she limited their communication, no video games, forced them to practice on their instrument for hours at a time. Um, but with both these examples, what we were talking about in class are what are the qualities that make someone a leader? Is a parent considered a leader? Is a president, who at the time has uh, subpar ratings, still considered a leader? And so we started talking about the different communication competencies, competencies that create a leader. And a few things popped up, such as cultural variables. So for instance, Amy Chua, according to most American parents, would not be considered a very good parent or leader to her children. However, when put in the context of a traditional Chinese society, she'd be one of the best because her children are both productive and overachieving students. So point in case is that you need to contextualize information that you hear rather than trying to understand or analyze it in a vacuum. You need to make sure you bring in uh, relevant historical factors as well as relevant relational factors to make sure you understand everything that's being discussed. And again that was Dr. Z. Schaefer with his commentary on communications. We appreciate his candid responses, as always. And as always, we are so happy to welcome back to the SLU TV studios, the Power Panel. And on this week's Power Panel, we have Danny Lobb, he's a Republican strategist, J.P. Johnson, he's a Democratic strategist, and of course, Brett Kostreski, who's a senior political analyst for Mondays in Midtown. Welcome back to the panel, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Brett. Great to be here. Right. Let's first start with the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, which many thought was gonna be held uh, in St. Louis, but it, Charlotte, North Carolina got the nod from the DNC committee. Danny, what are your initial uh, thoughts on that? Well, Mark, two quick things. The first is that it's sad for St. Louis. Tons of jobs, tons of energy that could have been focused here. That would have been nice to have, regardless of your political affiliation, nice to have the convention here. The second thing is, the Democrats, I think it shows that maybe they think Missouri is not quite as in play. Maybe they're, they're a little bit worried about it. I don't know. Uh, I feel like if they really thought that Claire McCaskill was in, in jeopardy, they would have had it here and tried to solidify it, try to solidify the governor's race, I think it's kind of saying they don't care as much as we thought. Is that true, JPJ? No, it's false. I got one quick point. It's actually great for Claire McCaskill. If you go back to the 2008 election, Barack Obama carried Indiana, he carried North Carolina, he carried Nevada, he lost Missouri, which is right next to Illinois. Uh, Claire McCaskill also, uh, and many Democrats in the Midwest and the South actually did better in states that Obama won when they ran uh, statewide. So I think to try to save a Senate seat, you put it in the South, you try to win the South, no Democratic president has won without winning the South. Good move. Brett, do you, do you think that not having the DNC uh, will help Claire McCaskill? Um, well, I think if you look back at it, the history of political conventions, there's really not too much of a correlation between the location of the convention and the success in that state, especially when they try to choose a swing state. I think the, actually the more interesting angle of this choice is the uh, union angle. North Carolina is the least unionized state in America with very strong right to work laws in, in their books. Uh, state employees are not allowed to unionize uh, and such like that. So a lot of unions are, get, are a little upset about that choice, especially with Obama's uh, lack to push on the card check law as well. Uh, I guess, you know, you guys brought up uh, 
Claire McCaskill, and she's going to face re-election here in, in 2012. A lot of speculation on uh, who's going to run against her. I mean, there's already a few candidates that said they would uh, run against her, one of those being Sarah Steele, and the other one announced last week is Ed Martin. Danny, do either of those two candidates have what it takes to beat Claire McCaskill? I think so. But you know what? What's really interesting is I think it's going to be a three-horse race. I think there's going to be a few, a few more entrants before the end of this. Um, with, with Ann Wagner here in Missouri, uh, here in St. Louis, and then also Joan Emerson is thinking really hard about it, more than people's given her credit for. I think we're going to see another horse in this race, but I think all four of those candidates have a legitimate shot at beating Claire McCaskill. JPJ, is, is Claire going to win? Yes. Yeah, you seem yes. very confident about that. No, no shot. Uh, Ed Martin has no shot. Uh, he did. He ran very well in a year where Republicans uh, took back 63 seats in the House of Representatives, and he still lost. So in 2012, when things were Barely in Dick Gephardt's district. But still, 63, the biggest upset since 1932, and Ed Martin still lost. <laughs> so you take 2012 with all the, the youth vote that's going to come out, the African-American vote that's going to come out, you're going to have way more liberals voting this time around than, uh, than they did in 2010 because they're going to have a reason to want to keep the White House as opposed to uh, congressional seats. No shot. Right. The youth vote came out pretty hard in uh, 2000, uh, 2008 to elect Barack Obama, but he lost Missouri. Do you, do you think Claire McCaskill will see some of those uh, trends in her election? It's possible, but I think the key to Missouri, as uh, always, Missouri is going to reflect the national picture very, uh, very much so. And I think the key to that race is going to be who's on the presidential ticket for Republicans. Is it going to be someone that's going to be able to get the the Republicans here in Missouri, maybe the moderate Republicans and even moderate Democrats, if they can get that swing? McCaskill's. Uh, going to be in the same trouble spot that a lot of Democrats were in 2010. So depending on who the Republican is on the presidential line, I think that's what's going to make the difference. Well, let's stick with that topic of 2012 Republican nominees for the Republican uh, slot, the office of the presidency of the United States of America. Uh, you have th each one of you have to give me three potential candidates that you think uh, would, you mean, would, will come out to the top three, at least, on the Republican side. Starting with you, Danny. Uh, Mitt Romney, obviously topping it. I think. Plenty will be will be up there, but I don't think he's going to win. And then I would really like to see this is really like to see John Thune run. I don't know how if he could actually get the money behind it, but I'd really like to see him run. JBJ, three realistic candidates for the Republicans. Uh, Huntsman, Huckabee Thune, and Brett. That was fast. Um, I'm going to say Tim Pawlenty. Uh, I don't think he's going to win though. A, a dark horse could be Mitch Daniels. See if he jumps into the race. Uh, he he's very popular among the base. And I, I think Mitt Romney's infrastructure is just too big to be ignored. None of you said uh, Sarah Palin. Kind of surprised. Not, neither of you think or any of you think that uh, Sarah Palin will run and or be at the top of the list? I'll say the Republicans here and as the lone Democrat on this panel, most Republicans don't take Sarah Palin serious. They don't think she has the wherewithal to actually carry on a national conversation. She's very exciting. She brings in a lot of money. But when you... 3 a.m. Uh, conversation when the phone rings at 3 o'clock. Do you envision Sarah Palin answering the phone and taking care of the serious problems that are going on in Egypt? Do you see her really conversing with uh, Hu Jintao in China? Do you see her making the consequential issues that serious Republicans can, like a Huntsman, like a Mitch Daniels, who was on B uh, for Bush, like a John Thune, who took off, uh, who uh, took out Tom Daschle in the Senate race in 2002? You know, you, you have serious candidates out there, and Sarah Palin just doesn't stack up. Okie dokie, it's now time for, we thank the panel, it's now time for the Spotlight on St. Louis. Last episode, we took you to the Science Center. This week, we will travel across Highway 40 to visit the James S. McDonnell Planetarium. The Planetarium, which is part of the Science Center, is accessible from the Science Center through a bridge across the highway, or from inside Forest Park. If you choose to visit the planetarium via the bridge, you will find that it is equipped with binoculars, bead readers, and clear plastic sections of the floor to better view and determine the science of the cars passing underneath. Once you cross the bridge, you will find yourself entering a tunnel. The tunnel has displays of popular space memorabilia, including R2-D2. There is also information on various space exploration missions. The planetarium has on display two capsules, a spacesuit, and many of the spaceships that Boeing has designed. The real gem of the planetarium, however, you have to pay for. The planetarium shows are $5 for adults and $4 for children. The upstairs exhibit is $9 for adults and $7 for children or seniors. Once you have paid, you will be ushered into possibly the coolest elevator you have ever ridden on and enter the planetarium dome. I asked the Associate Director of the Planetarium, David Ritchie, to tell us about their star shows. This time of year we have four different shows. Uh, each one is 
uh, targeted to a different age group. Uh, we have a show called Moon Rock for early learners, like you know, kids that between kindergarten and second grade. We've got a show called Planets of the Sun, which is a tour of the solar system. We've got one called Change Your Latitude, which takes you up to the North Pole and then down south of the equator to see stars of the Southern Hemisphere. And our fourth show is called Mr. Hubble's Universe, which is all about Edwin Hubble and the Hubble Space Telescope. Every star show it has two parts to it. We typically start with a live presentation that's called The Sky Tonight. And what we do is set the star field overhead for the evening's nighttime sky and take a little tour to see what planets, stars, and constellations are up that time of year. So that if you get a chance to go out and do some stargazing, you know what is up and what to look for. Then it's followed with one of those feature shows like I mentioned. If you choose to visit the exhibit, you will view a reconstruction of the Mars rover and touch a piece of Martian rock. You'll see what it's like to live in space. They've included just about every aspect, such as what and how you eat, sleep, exercise, shower, how the air and water are recycled, and how the power is monitored. Upstairs, you will walk through what looks like your typical sci-fi spaceship corridor. To learn information on planets, it has been updated to exclude Pluto, stars, galaxies, and more. The planetarium is a wonderful resource for all aspects of space and an interesting way to spend the day. The best part of the planetarium is the star projector. Uh, there are only four of them like it in the country, and this is the latest technology in uh, star projectors using fiber optics. Uh, there's one like this in New York, one in Los Angeles, one in Oakland, California, and we've got the fourth one right here in St. Louis. Uh, the other thing going far is that we have the largest dome in all of North America. So anybody who comes here to see a star show is seeing the most realistic sky available at any planetarium anywhere in the country. And again, that was a spotlight on St. Louis. Great job, Amanda. I love, L-O-V-E, love the Science Center. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to do this, but I'm being told I had to by our producer, our man on the streets, uh, Taylor McDonald, because uh, I'm a Rams fan. But it is, it, with the Super Bowl in mind, it is proper to offer congratulations to Tom Brady for winning the MVP. Uh, this was, it was a unanimous decision by the people who vote, which was the first time in NFL, uh, in NFL history that it was, it was that unanimous. Um, and it's the second uh, MVP award that Tom Brady has won in his career. Um, but it's important also to note that they lost to the Jets. And it was great to see his face when they did lose to the Jets as he offers one of those fingers that it's not appropriate to use uh, in public. So congratulations, Tom Brady. Either way you look at it, congratulations to the Packers as well. Folks, you can always email us. Mondays in Midtown at gmail.com. And in closing, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start something new, a new tradition, if you will. It's called our Alonzo Garbanzo Clip of the Week. And you probably have no idea who Alonzo Garbanzo is. And I really don't either. Uh, but we're going to try to get in contact with him, uh, with him so he can come on the show at some point. But He's on YouTube, check out his channel, uh, but he plays the instruments, the songs, and he, and he cut, plays them separately and puts them all together in a video format. And he just has to be one of the most intriguing characters I've ever seen do any song on YouTube. So uh, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, here is the Alonzo Garbanzo Clip of the Week. Good night. We'll see you next time. Hello. Hello. You're here because you're a sensible person and you don't have a dirty mind, so you won't read salacious meaning into the lyrics. Some people have done this with this song, but you wouldn't do that. So since the lyrics aren't salacious at all, I have no problem singing this song, and I'm going to do it right now, like this.
everything's all right. Can I get away again tonight? And the only one who could ever teach me was the son of a preacher to man. The only one who could ever teach me was the son of a preacher man. More consonants and a vowel. I had a good point too. Damn it! Yeah, yeah. he was going. Jobs, he was going. Jobs, 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 jobs. jobs, jobs, jobs. <laughs> <laughs> it's the economy, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jonas Miller. He's a night crawler. Yeah, two chips stuck together equals one nacho. <laughs>